Today's class, we are dealing with uh, a few topics which are the countermeasures uh, uh, to previous topics, uh, which we have seen like a vulnerability test and penetration testing. So they will be covered in uh, on layers of uh, data transmission. So that is what we are going to cover today. So we have concepts like fireball, IDS, and IPS. Honeypot. So these are all uh, uh, a theory, theoretical modules. We don't have any practical for these modules. So whatever the modules we have to now. And uh, physical security. And uh, cryptography. And social engineering. Patch management. So these are the modules uh, which we left with uh, uh, theoretical concepts. So we'll start with uh, 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 physical security. So physical security is like it is a protection physical layer. So you have a OSI seven layers in that. So the first layer is a physical layer. So in physical layer, how can you protect your data? And how can you uh, uh, create a, a secure environment and all? We'll discuss it now. In physical security. So physical security is a very, very important in you know, a MNC companies uh, kind of uh, environment. Why? Because so if you observe your company's uh, CPUs, uh, you can see a physical lock that is provided to the CPU. So they will lock your CPU with a physical lock. And not only that, if you want to enter into your company, you need a smart card. So smart card or based authentication. So that is a counterpart for uh, physical, I mean, local attacks. So only the authorizer first can enter into that uh, particular environment. So we have seen some uh, attacks and all, but physically you can do so many things, not with the computers. So physically is a uh, is a kind of thing like suppose uh, like you are hosting some websites in, from your web server. So in to that web server uh, you may have a three or four uh, employees working that particular server. So you should keep that server in an environment where only the four persons can enter into that ODC or cabin or whatever it may be. Why? Because if they are having access to everyone, if they have access to everyone, so they can access that system or you can access that ODC. So the issue will be like, the unauthorized person can open it and they can modify or whatever they want, or they can steal important information of a web server. So anything. So that is why in most of the service-based companies, what they will do is, according to the project, they will divide the ODC. So we have some ODCs at uh, 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 Cognizant. So uh, we have some projects like uh, Lloyd's Bank and and uh, ESI scripts uh, company and uh, uh, Xerox company. So we are doing some projects in my company. So each and every project is having a separate ODC and they have a physical security like you should not take your SIMs, you should not carry your phones with camera and uh, uh, Bluetooth or, or this kind of technologies. If you have your phone with these technologies, those phones are not allowed inside the OBC. So, so they have a physical security like that, so they can restrict the user not to uh, take the samples of uh, sensitive information or something like that. So Lloyd's Bank is a very uh, confidential project and all. So why? Because it is a bank-related project. So they may have a sensitive information in their servers or in their so that is why what they will do is they will create a physical security environment so that um, they, they will prepare some uh, uh, cautions and all. 
and uh, that security guard should maintain these things. So, basing on the smart code authentication, they will send. I mean, uh, you will be having permission to enter into the device. So, only few smart cards will be allowed. So, your ID will be map mapped with that particular uh, uh, smart card authentication system, and only you people should enter. So, that is how the physical security matters a lot in uh, companies uh, uh, to protect their data and all. And they will use a physical box and all. So uh, you know what? If you don't have physical locks to your CPU in company, everyone will take the hard. Uh, everyone will take hard to the home, and they can copy all the things for sure. Why? Because no one will uh, monitor that CPU. No one will come to your CPU, and no one will check that. Why? Because you may have so many systems in the company, so they can't. Uh, monitor each and every CPU, so that is why they keep a physical lock, and there will be a master key. They can open it, so that is how the physical security matters. So you have to protect at each every point uh, whenever a person is entering into that portion. So that is how the physical security matters in physical layer, and we we have a, a big like cryptography. So we have discussed like a physical security, right? Oh, from starting point to ending point, how or how we have to tackle the security feature now. So using smart card authentication and all. But what about you're sending some data in a network? So we have seen a MITM attack, for example. So as you're sending some data to the remote system, that data can be seen in the oh, and enable tool. So we are sniffing the data and you are getting it. So in network layer, what's happening is we are sniffing the data and we are trying to use the data, um, a plaintiff's usernames and passwords and all. So to avoid that, to mitigate that issue, we have a concept called cryptography. So what we will do is we'll implement SSL encryption. So secure socket layer encryption. So uh, that is what your HTTP is. We'll see about HTTP protocol in our web application security testing. So what is HTTP and what is HTTP? Yes. So we'll see in that course. So what we are doing is we are securing our data. We are protecting our data through SSL encryption. So if the data is encrypted and it is layer browser with an encryption, so what will happen is, if someone is sniffing your network, even though they are sniffing uh, your system or uh, your IP address, they can't data in plain text. That is what your browser is doing. So we have discussed in top browser, right? Uh, whenever you start sending the data to the remote system, so the, there will be some encryption links between all the nodes. So that is what the security they have uh, implemented in top. We have used as Russian proxy servers, and I told you like Chinese proxies are a bit uh, um, insecure. Why? Because they will provide you the proxy servers, but if you use them, they can sniff your uh, IP address and they can get the data. So to avoid that, they will implement uh, a Tor browser and all. They will implement this kind of uh, cryptography techniques to encrypt the data while you're sending it to the remote system. So SSL. so SSL implementation is very, very important in a network while you're sending data to the remote system. So, and next thing is implementing hashing techniques. So we will see this hashing techniques in uh, our web application security testing. So this hashing techniques, we have different hashing algorithm, algorithms like MD5 hashing and also RC4 some hashing techniques are there so the use of hashing techniques is suppose you have your application suppose you, you have created one uh, website so what whenever a user is trying to log into your system they have to create an account so before log into the system log into your application whatever it may be so that credential should be encrypted in hashing format 
the same thing we have seen in uh, Windows IT. So whenever you provide a password that is getting encrypted in SAM file, right? It is storing in SAM file by encrypting it. So the same thing should be implemented in vacations also. So you have seen so many um, attacks that, that are happening in the uh, internet, like uh, all two million user IDs and passwords are revealed or uh, linked in a website and that website, this website and all, uh, right? So usually what will happen, what will happen behind this attack is, suppose you are logging into my application, okay? So the next one is my website. So you're trying to log in. So what else, if you want to access my website, log in with your Gmail or Facebook or green credentials. So immediately what you'll do is you're not in a position to register everything, you're not in a position to create a account in my website. You'll simply go with the LinkedIn credentials. So once, not LinkedIn credentials, uh, sometimes what happens is log in with a uh, LinkedIn profile or something. So the data which is available in LinkedIn to your particular profile, so the first name, last name, phone number, date of birth and everything will be crawled my website and it will be the form will be autofill and i will say like uh, keep your password so enter the new thread and uh, re-enter the password and submit so usually what you'll do is as you are logging with the linkedin or facebook credential you will keep your uh, default password whatever the password you are using for that item. so what will happen is will not implement any hashing techniques or any encryption techniques to uh, protect users data so i'll keep the plain text usernames and passwords in a format in a plain text format so i will store all these credentials and all in my server so if someone hacks my uh, so website or something happens so what will happen is all these usernames and credentials will be available in the internet so it is not the fault of uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Gmail. They will encrypt your usernames and passwords for sure. Even Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have any idea about uh, your credentials. He doesn't know about anything about you. Right? Because uh, whatever the data you are presenting in the form, that will be encrypted immediately in their database. They can't even put the password or they can't decrypt the password even. So, the main is when you are logging into a party website with your Facebook or any other credentials, you should be aware of that website, whether they are secure or not. Some websites are secure, some websites are not secure. Even my account is got hacked uh, three years back. So what happened is I have logged in into a website called Black Hat SEO. So with my the gmail credentials first gmail credentials first gmail account so what happened is my gmail credentials are available in the internet for free i have checked that database and all so i got my credentials in dark networks or browser so they are selling that uh, data in the dark web so uh, somewhere i got the data i downloaded it i just checked whether my account is available or not in the uh, file so unfortunately, my Gmail ID and passwords are uh, visible in my data. So no website is secure. So you should be take care of your uh, credentials. Of course, I'll change my passwords every time. So every month I'll change my password. So that is why I'm secure, a bit secure. So but still, uh, you should take care of your accounts and all while you are uh, logging in party websites or any other. Uh, uh, any other websites so that is how you should implement hashing techniques and all and next we have social engineering social engineering is a common word uh, it is like uh, manipulating the human's brain suppose say like you can call uh, recently one uh, scam has happened in india what happened is 
they are getting mails and messages from uh, airtel not only airtel every telecom provider is sending those messages to each and every customer so the thing is you have to register your sim card with your other card you have to register your sim card with the other number so one guy got a call from airtel like uh, we are calling from airtel you need to register your sim card with our uh, sim card uh, um, like pointing with the other card so we have to make a pointing with your other card number so just give your other card number so that we can uh, make your uh, sim activate or else uh, your sim will get blocked something like that so we have uh, said something to the customer so what he has done is he has given his other card number and everything they have collected all the information and finally they have sent a message to the phone so what they have said is you will get a message just let me know your whatever the otp you have so he has given OTP. so they have said like congratulations your sim card is pointed to your other card number so you get a message to one to one somewhat uh, something has happened so he has shared his message to the telecaller so after one day or one and a half day what happened is his salary is one and a half lakh he spent twenty thousand rupees so one lakh thirty five thousand is available in their in his account so suddenly they have deducted that uh, one lakh thirty five thousand so he went to bank and everywhere so no one answered directly what happened is they have cloned his sim card so simply they have cloned his sim card and they they got otp and all to their sim card and they have uh, transferred all their uh, all his funds to the their account so this is what the social engineering is actually there is no such calls of uh, 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 there is no call i mean they are not making any calls like this to any customer we have to go to the retailers and you have to register your other card there but this guy doesn't know about this but of course everyone knows about it like uh, they are sending messages and all so in that way they have collected all the information but basically what's happening is you show to the retailer and you should register that so why because these are the things hap uh, can happen in the uh, real world. So that's what the social engineering is. Even sometimes you may face social engineering. They will call you and they will ask details and they will say like, hey, you got a lottery. Of course, you are getting some lottery mails and everything. Right now, they have stopped the sending this lottery mails to mail ID. So because everyone got an idea about this lottery mails and all. But before that, even my friends, send uh, 10,000 rupees to the uh, lottery mails and all. They have collected this money. They have sent their order, ID card, what, everything they have sent to the mail. So, no one say, um, tells you about this, but you know what? Uh, everyone feels like they were getting 10,000 rupees or $10,000, something like that. And they will send that money to the, uh, that particular uh, <coughs> social engineer <laughs> so you should be aware of all these things while you're getting mail and uh, while you're sending a mail whatever you're doing so that is why we have an email analysis we have to check whether it is getting from a, a particular uh, company or not so social engineering can be happened uh, in many ways like through mail through phone calls or through publicly available sources whatnot anything can happen. in which way they will come we don't know we can decide uh, uh, whether we have uh, uh, this kind of attacks are happening in our accounts or not so we should be aware of all these uh, social engineering techniques and all so you should not reveal your card number uh, cvv number and all so change password uh, all the time even my credit card got compromised. Not only mine, uh, most of the SPI credit cards got compromised in India. So what happened is every time I'm getting OTPs without doing any transaction. 
I'm not doing any transaction, but still I'm getting OTP. That means it is a very, very serious threat. So immediately have change in my pin price. So whenever you're getting a OTP, you should change your uh, pin, pin number. So whenever you're doing transaction for one week, of course you're doing a one week transactions. Suppose select like you went for uh, dinner or you went for shopping, or you, you, you made some transactions in the internet or something like that. Immediately you have to change your pin within a week. Why? Because they don't know where they're, uh, when, uh, what they're doing actually. So they can use magnetic strips to cap all the data and all. So you should be very careful with the credit cap. So be aware of all these things while you're doing transactions or getting mails, or phishing mails, what, everything. Even for Cognizant also, we are getting phishing mails. Yesterday I had one health related health policy related uh, phishing mail so my browser got detected that this is a phishing mail so immediately i have deleted that mail so that is you'll get some uh, phishing mail like this is uh, these are comes under social engineering attack so that is what the social engineering is and coming to patch management So patch management is a kind of thing. It is, uh, I have already explained you about this, like uh, uh, in penetration testing, we are attacking the uh, remote system, right? So if you have a recent update now, you can fix that vulnerability. So we have a MS0867, it's a vulnerability, but you will get an update for that vulnerability on the time. So you should update your operating system and all, or else you'll face some issues like this. So and anyone can attack with using that vulnerability. So you have to update your software, operating system, and all your even your firewall and antivirus also. So for patch, we have a best tool in the market, uh, which is a free tool. So you can use this for your uh, system, Bella advisor. So this is Bellark Advisor. You can uh, download this software and you can install it in your system. Uh, so you can run it. You can run it on Windows 10 and all. All the server operating systems and everywhere. So once you download it, install it. And you can see all the data related to your system. The data will be like what USB circuit in uh, in past, and uh, what are the updates you have in the internet for your system, and are there any uh, so are there any new updates for your softwares and all? Is there any other uh, you want to add to your system everything you can get it from this so this is a good tool to analyze your system security so you can install it and you can check out this advisor so that will help you a lot to make your system secure so just wait for it you'll get an html page with all the details about your uh, system status As I have uh, so many softwares and all, getting time to check all the updates. So, if you have a, uh, uh, I mean, less programs and all, so it will take, it don't take uh, it won't take much time to analyze it. I don't want to check my local network. I don't have anything in this, so I'll, I'll skip this. If you have a network, then you can do it or else uh, no need of that. So 
you are getting this uh, in the HTML page. Yes. So virus protection up to date, but don't believe this. So your virus protection is completely, uh, you know, it's a hallucination. <laughs> virus protection is a hallucination. Why? Because I have only Windows Defender. So Windows Defender is not a strong uh, virus protection uh, program. So so missing security updates, seven missing security updates right there. And this is my system model, serial number dog, and memory modules, my 12 GB memory RAM, my 12 GB RAM. I have a 4 GB RAM and 8 GB RAM. And I have a two more slots which are empty. So you can see that. And my EDFH drives, the capacity. You know, the plus I don't have any printers and uh, my user account. And you can see here, see what devices are connected. I'm using headphones right now. What not all the information about your system. USB storage used in past 30 days. I don't have any USB connected devices. I will not use any USB device. I won't, I don't connect any USB devices to my system. Why? Because that is the only way you get the virus, in my opinion. Why? Because from internet, you won't get much. Uh, we have a strong uh, analyzers and all in the internet. So, uh, you can't get that virus from the internet, but the virus mostly 90s and you'll get it from USB devices itself. So if you want to transfer data, uh, use uh, clouds, send the data from uh, your mobile to the cloud and from cloud, you can download it. So that is the best way to transfer the data. So your system don't take risk. Uh, why? Because day to day you're getting so many malware's of like, ransomware and everything. So try to send your data through the cloud so that makes you uh, secure and now. So, so these are the updates. We have to fix it. And uh, so these are the applications that I have, I am running in my system. So these many programs are there. So then I have used and what I'm using it. So Internet Explorer, it's in for me. So this is how you'll get complete information about your system. So this is Belak advice of a download it, keep it with you. That will help you a lot in future someone is using your laptop, if someone used your laptop, so you can run this Belark advisor and you can see what USB devices have connected to it and what they have done and everything. So that is how Belark advisor is useful. So download it and you can use it in your system. So that is all about patch management. You can do the patch management by using this Belark advisor. So and we have some other tools, but I, I didn't remember all those tools, but um, Belark Advisor is a good tool for batch management. And next, we have a firewall, IDS and IPS and Honeypot. So I'll tell you the difference. And uh, uh, we have seen firewall uh, usage in Nmap uh, for acknowledgement scan, we have done it. So we have configured the firewall and we have seen the status of uh, basic scan. So coming to firewall, IDS and Honeypot, the differences between all these three and how they can protect you is like, uh, just give me a second. Give me a second. Yeah, 
sorry. So we have firewall IDS and IPS Honeypot uh, to protect our network basically. So coming to firewall, what firewall can do? See, firewall can block the malicious packets that are coming to your network. So we have seen in uh, that in uh, Wireshark sniffing, uh, uh, sniffing attack. So in sniffing, we have seen foul, how you can set the rules for firewall to see any malicious packet in Wireshark. So you will be in ACL rules, access control list rules, and you can update the firewall and you can say, if you can see any ACK packet is coming to your system, block it. So firewall will check the rule set and it will identify the malicious one and it will lock it. And remaining things, it won't bother about it and it will allow into the system. So that is what the functionality, functionality about the firewall. And coming to IDS and IPS, what they will do is, they will see the malicious attack that is happening in the, system, in the network and immediately they will send the report to the, uh, I mean, the administrator or somewhere so they won't block it and ips is an advanced one it can block and alert you firewall won't alert you like someone is attacking your system be alert or it won't send any messages or kind of things but ids what it will do is it can detect the attack and it alert you but it won't block ids won't block the attack it will just alert you that something is happening and coming to IPS, it is an advanced device comparing with firewall and IDS. So what it will do is it will alert you at the same time it will block the attack. So you can write the rule set for IPS also. Even for IDS also, we have rule set. So that is what IDS, IPS and firewall. And coming to honeypot, honeypot is a, a, a kind of concept like if someone is attacking your system or if someone is attacking your application or network frequently, then you can create a honeypot. All the bank websites are having honeypots. So when you try to insert some malicious data inside the application, so what the honeypot will do is, or what the firewall will do is, it will divert that particular uh, malicious data to a dumb application. So usually what hackers feel is when they invent any malware attack on the website. So they will feel like they have had that website. But what Honeypot will do is it is a dummy application. It will go on like that. Hacker will go on like that to attack the application one by one by one, one by one. But at the end, he couldn't find anything. So he will come back uh, a desperate mode and everything. Why? Because you won't get anything in the honeypot it is a dummy website uh, it's a own copy of this particular uh, original website whenever firewall or any other uh, packet filtering through packet filtering techniques if they identify is trying to insert some malicious uh, uh, things in the application immediately they will divert it to the honeypot so Honeypot will manage all these kind of attacks as a trap. It is a trap and it will monitor, uh, it will take the malicious attacks and everything to uh, the dummy application and it will divert the attacker to a, a dummy application. So that is what firewall ideas and IPS and honeypot. So Chatan here, is, is that clear or uh, do you have any doubts or anything? No, I'm good. Okay. So this is all about uh, uh, the theoretical modules we have for the EC Council. And uh, the final topic is social engineering. Sorry. <laughs> uh, software tracking. As I'm good in social engineering, I'm getting all the time social engineering. So software cracking, software cracking is a good technique uh, to crack your softwares and make it a full version. So software cracking is dealing with uh, your assembly language. 
and uh, system input and outputs and uh, you have some uh, uh, ram related activities oh, and uh, completely will deal with the low level languages so what's happening and why we are doing social software tracking and why we are looking into software tracking so what's happening in the real world is we are downloading a software and we are installing it for a trial version uh, for 15 days after that we'll purchase it or we will uninstall it right so while you insert any uh, uh, a fake credentials that means any uh, wrong credentials or something immediately it will say like a invalid credentials right so these invalid credentials tells you like this is these credentials are not matched with the original credentials so that software is having a right answer suppose I like if i ask you two plus two how much it is you will say like four if i ask you three plus three you will say six if i say nine plus three immediately you'll say 12. so if i ask you 25386 plus 35372 now you have a problem so you don't know how much it is you'll say like a something uh, a big number so you'll say like it's a big number that's it you don't know you don't say the exact number uh, by adding those two numbers so what's happening what is the reason behind uh, two plus two and this big number the reason behind these two scenarios is the first case 2 plus 2 3 plus 3 and 9 plus 3 you know these answers you know these ans uh, exact answers 2 plus 2 equal to 4 you read so many times in your childhood now every time 1 plus 1 you know the answer but coming to a big number like 25,386 plus 35,376 you have not done any calculation with these two numbers any time in your from in, in your life or you didn't do any addition or subtraction or any kind of activities with these two numbers so that is why you can't say what is the final value for these two numbers so the first scenario is you you know the answer you have the answer with you so that is why you are telling exact number my second scenario you have not done any calculation or anything in the in your lifetime so that you don't know the answer so that is why you will struggle with uh, those two guys. The same thing is, the same law is applicable to software tracking. So what will happen when you install the software, the software itself is having the, the right credentials. And, and when you provide the wrong credentials, it will compare with the original credentials. And if it is matching with the original credentials, immediately it will say like an invalid credentials. So they have an algorithm basing upon the username, they will create the license key. So whatever the username you are giving, basing on that, you create an algorithm. Uh, they will create an algorithm that they will take the username and according to them, generate a serial. So that depends on the username. So that is how they will create a, a license key and they will compare it. So this is what happening with the software. So that is why we are trying to find out that actual credentials that are hidden in this software. Okay, that is what the problem. I got the problem and I have solved it. I, I got the solution also. Now I have to implement it to crack the software. So how to implement it? So before going to implement, have to get into this like we should have an idea about uh, how software works so, so your software will work like suppose your software is written in java okay so this software when you install that so uh, software inside your system what will happen is it will be converted into assembly line So this assembly language will speak with kernel 
about this operations and all. And the kernel will make into binary data and it will send to the hardware. So it means your uh, motherboard and all. So this is the process of uh, uh, giving instructions to the hardware. Suppose you are sending data. I mean, uh, suppose you have opened a software and you say uh, print. So the software which is written in Java, it will send that print instruction in assembly language. It will convert that particular instruction into assembly language and the SN language instruction will be given to the kernel and kernel will convert into binary and binary will be converted, uh, will be given to the hardware and hardware will try to decode the same way. That means, so the decoding process will be done in uh, reverse or whatever you have sent the data in which way you have sent and you will get the output in software. So this is what the actual communication is with the hardware. So here, whatever the software, whatever the language you have used, C, C++, Java, Perl, Python, whatever it may be, that will be converted into assembly language. And assembly language will be given to the kernel. Kernel, will, uh, kernel can understand the assembly language and it will convert into binary to the hardware, as hardware knows only binary language, one and zero, high voltage and low voltage. So kernel is very, very important here. It is the middle person make the conversation between the user and the hardware. So here, we, uh, when we observe the binary and S languages are common for all the C, C++, Java, whatever the program. So here we can't start binary language, but we can study SMB language. As assembly language is, a, is in user readable format, so you can understand what is assembly language and how it is working. So every software, whatever the software you have, Java or C, C++, whatever the program you have used and when you create a software, so while you compile it, while you're creating an executable file, so of course your Windows will be using a .exe file, right? If you want to install a software, the software should be in .exe format. So once you create .exe, whatever the program you have written, so it is a secure program that no one can uh, decode it and no one reverse engineer it and they can't take the code. So we have written uh, a software in Java. So you can reverse engineer it or uh, they won't get the actual code. They can't get the actual code. If you open it with the bad, you won't get the actual code. So .exe is a very secure code that it will pack entire code and it will convert into other so once you make the .exe, it is completely secure. No one can crack code. So we can't crack the code. If you can crack the code of .exe, it is easy to get the sensitive. But here it's not happening. So that is why what we will do is, we will install the .exe and we will take the binaries and we will, as, uh, we will uh, analyze in assembly language using disassemblers. We have softwares to take the exe file and convert it into assembly language. So those are called disassemblers. So this disassemblers helps you to uh, make the .exe file into a readable format. So we have a debugger, it's a good disassembler. We have so many other MASM and all, but only debugger is a good tool for uh, disassembling. So we have that tool in Windows 2007. You can download it from the internet also. Very small software. Uh, you don't need to purchase, they are free. So.
so we have uh, already worked there and i'm using first i'll install a software uh, we have seen that in uh, key logos topic of it logo of course i have a keygen but i'm not using keygen right now i will install the software next yes next yes so so if you are here it is asking directly the registration code so if you enter a registration code here and if you click on okay so what it's saying registration code or use is invalid so it is saying like whatever the code you have written that is valid so i'm copying that error so i have copied that error and i have pasted it in the back so it is checking with the original username and the registration code and you got a wrong username so suppose say i have uh, um, given uh, chaitanya suppose i have given chaitanya still it is saying like a wrong username and password so i'll try to crack a code license key for your name so i click on exit so now the software is already installed so what i'll do is i'll take a this is a it's a free to you can see so just open the software it is installed in c drive program files dpk perfect key logger and this is the installation file you can see that dot exe file right so open up the exe file that is already installed and your dot exe file is made into human readable format so this is entire code of dpk perfect key logger what we have done is we taken that exe file and converted it into human readable format that is assembly language and this is the entire language we can see and these are the address locations of your ram so when this software executes these locations will become active and it will work on the address locations and this is the actual code block and this is a cpu window and the text dump window so this is a dump you see the data and everything of each and every instruction and this is your window which executes your instructions one by one so now it's very easy don't uh, think like it's a complicated one very easy one we are just looking out for registration that's it we are not going with the programs we are not doing anything we are not going to do anything we just searching out for a license key <coughs> sorry so what ha uh, what happened with this uh, software when you enter a wrong credential so it is checking with the original credentials right those original credentials are available in this entire code okay that is your error also available in this code so whatever that you got that this error is also available in this entire code right so i'll search that error why because i have only that uh, uh, error so i'll search it for the error wherever it is having in the entire code so if you if you right click and go to search for you have all reference or text strings so that is the reference text string right uh, registration error so i want to search out for that text string and all the reference text strings will be separated from the code so this is the code and in that code you have a different text strings that will be separated here so here you can see print and some other uh, text strings are available and right click and search for text. so search for that error 
uncheck this case sensitivity and click on entire score. Copy this error and paste it over here and click on OK. So here you can see that a registration error, registration code or username is invalid. Please check off your center. You've got your error in this signal application. 0416C17. So this is location of your uh, registration block. So if you double click on this block, you will go to that position in that entire code. You have to go one by one, one by one, one by one location, but it is a huge code. You can't go like this. So that is why we have separated the text strings and into the entire location. So here you can see this registration code block. So that is why it is giving you error. So if you observe here, there is a ending of this block, right? So that means the effort belongs to registration code. So go to the top, the starting of that block. So this is this block entirely belongs to registration code. So what I will do is I want to play only this registration code block. So what I'll do is I'll keep uh, I'll press M. So if you press F2 key, there is a breakpoint set on this location. So what I'm doing is I'm just running only that code block. I'm not running entire software. Okay, I'm just running that code. So if I click on play button, if you observe, only that registration block is got executed. So enter registration code. So I'm creating a license key on your name. And I'll enter a dummy code like one one two 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 three 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 four four. Why I have given one one two two three three and four four? You'll get understand um, now. So if you observe the CPU window, observe the CPU window. What will happen if I click on OK? Okay. So if you observe here, something had happened, but uh, we couldn't identify it. So what happened? This entire registration code block is got executed. But as the CPU instructions are executing very fastly, that is why you put it up. So your processor is too high. Uh, it is a high speed. So that is why it executed all the code at a time in a second, in a nanosecond. But uh, we have to slow down CPU instruction execution. So what you can do is if you press eight, F8 key, it will execute one by one instruction. Observe the CPU will. So observe here, wherever I'm pointing the mouse. So if you see, it is executing one by one instruction in, in uh, different registers. See here, we got the first code block, one by one. one. First code block, second code block, to second, third code block, first, second, third code block, fourth, one, two, three, four code blocks. So it is comparing these four code blocks with the username. So that is why I have entered double one on double two, double two. So it is easy for you to understand which code block is ready. And your name, username, and your core block, these four core blocks and user design. So these two are compared with the original key. So this is the original key. Let me copy this. I have pasted it. I got the original one. You can close this. Work is done. So I'll delete extra things what I so I'll delete everything. So this is your license key with your username. 
So this is your username and that is the key. Let me check. Okay. So shall we and K B T K R W H W B H P I F P C X and if I give up, okay. Here you can see registration succeeded. Thank you for two perfect below. So we got a full license key, full license of perfect killer. So this is what your username and uh, license key. If you keep C with a capital C, then in the code will change. This won't work. So if you keep a case, uh, uh, uppercase letters also, it does a lot. So you should use whatever the letters you use for cracking. So then only that particular key will work. So this is all about the software pack. So Chaitanya, is it clear? Yeah, Dinesh. So this is all about uh, uh, software pack. So we have done with all the ethical hack concepts and uh, we have to jump with uh, uh, web application security testing. So are you okay? Can I? Continue with the uh, web application, or you, know, you want time to review all this? Uh, you can continue. Okay, all right. So, uh, today we'll see the introduction of web application security testing and uh, and we'll start with actual. Uh, web application security testing topics and all from tomorrow onwards. I'll give an introduction because I don't want to start with uh, all the concepts today itself. Um, just uh, I'll go for an introduction. Just give me a second. Okay, so so in the web application security testing, it is very different comparing with ethical hacking. So ethical hacking is your base course, and you will see some of the concepts of ethical hacking in web application security testing also. So before going to that, we'll see the method sheet of the uh, application security testing. So we discussed about ethical hacking methodology, but we didn't discuss about application security testing methodology. So the first step methodology is, of course, of course it is information gathering. It is also called as a reconnaissance. So reconnaissance is the first step of uh, application security testing methodology, that is information gathering. So we'll collect as much information as we can uh, about the target. Say, if you are having a black box testing, that means if you are not providing with any sort of information, you have to uh, attack the application or if, if you have to test the application without any information, then we have to start from first, that is information gathering. So in this, we've uh, collected information in ethical hacking, like a DNS records, IP address, operating system information, and uh, whatnot, all kind of technology, kind of information, and all using information gathering technique. So that is your first step to gather information like URL of the application 
and uh, I mean, I'm talking about the security testing perspective in companies. So, URL of the application, maybe IP address or a domain name, whatever it may be, provide anything that's up to them. So, URL of the application and roles that are available that is admin role, user role, whatever the roles you have in those roles, credentials, information, and all, and the metadata. So, we will collect this uh, information from the client. What is this dummy data? Uh, it's a sample data which we will use it for uh, application access. Suppose you will be have contact as one. If I give any other information, it won't accept it. It, it, it will support only company related information. Company IDs will be there. So they are very unique. You can't uh, use them in uh, external forms. So, uh, so we need some sample data to process the uh, process to the next step or something like that so we like these three important things from the client so if you have any other data also we have to collect that information so that is animation gathering and the second step is mapping so mapping is a technique where it is like a spidering or crawling we'll call them like a spidering or crawling we'll use a spidering technique to uh, i mean spidering or crawling both are same so what we will do in spidering is we will map out the application completely remember in companies while you're in a project you should keep a two days of time for mapping itself why because as your application is too big you have to map out the application how the application is working how what is the data flow from one form to another form and how the data is flowing from uh, step by step to the database and how exactly the data is working so you have to check each and every point using mapping technique so that is what we call the spidering technique so in spidering what we'll do is we'll crawl entire i mean all the links and things that are available in the website and we will check out each and every link how it is working and all so mapping is a technique to uh, map out complete application, whatever you have, to we'll check each and every link and everything. So we will do mapping there. And next, discover phase. Discover phase is finding weak points. So we'll discover some weak points in the application most in the input fields so we will try to find out the weak points the vulnerabilities in the application we will check out some put fields as input fields are vulnerable attacks so we will check out the weak points so because whatever the data you want to insert application you will insert through the inputs uh, input fields like your form uh, any form data or through url or through proxies whatever so you will try to check out uh, the points in the input fields. And next, we'll see exploitation. So exploitation is a kind of attack that is completely like attack. Uh, we will implement the attack. So we will check the weak points uh, in a tester point of view. Oh, oh, sorry, developer point of view. So in discover phase, what we'll do is we'll check the weak points in a developer view. So we will think like a developer and we will see how the developer created that application using different different entry points. So that is come that's under the developer view. And coming to exploitation view, uh, in exploitation, it will be like attacker view or test of view, whatever it may be. So we will attack the application as attacker using these uh, input fields and all. So if the input field is taking all sort of uh, data, that is like it is getting all the special characters and whatnot, everything. So in that scenario, what we will do is it is a weak point. So we will attack that weak point 
in the attacker point of view. And next, we have post exploitation. So post exploitation is like a developer view and as as well as attacker view. We'll see these two views in post exploitation. So in post exploitation, what we will do is after the attack, what's happening, what we can do. So after the attack, we'll see the uh, effects of attack and we will suggest the attackers how to cut the issue and everything. So that is called a remediation phase. So post exploitation is like we will analyze the impact and all, and we will see, uh, we will uh, suggest them like how to fix the issues. So that is called a remediation phase. And the next so final step is reporting. So the report is a phase where we will try to report everything, each and every attack and uh, suggestions, uh, remediation techniques and all to fix the issue and everything. So that comes in the reporting. In reporting, we have an executive summary. Executive summary report and developer report like this. So Executive summary report is now when you are trying to submit your report to the higher officials, admin department. So they don't have technical knowledge on this, what you're doing and all. So that, that is why they need only a, a brief explanation about the vulnerabilities. And coming to developer report, you'll submit each and every line of code and which code is vulnerable, which line is vulnerable and everything, and we'll submit a report. So this this is the methodology we'll use in web application security testing. We will collect information from the client. We will check out all the entry points and we'll map out the application completely, how application is working. And we'll see some weak points as a developer. If you are developer, how you will identify the weak points and all, uh, how, ma uh, how you will map out the application and all. So we will map out the application as a developer. And when we see this, uh, weak points and all, we'll try to exploit that uh, big points. And when we exploit it and we attack that uh, particular input field, we will get uh, a clear picture about that, I mean, uh, how the attack is working and all. So we will analyze that impact and everything in post exploitation phase as a developer and a view, and we'll fix that issue by suggesting some uh, remediation techniques to the data. And finally, once you're done with the remediation techniques and all, we will report them in a two formats, like a summary report or a developer report, and some other reports are there, but you are encoding. So we will report them to the executives or developers. So this is the methodology we use it in the application security testing. The same thing will follow in companies also even we will follow the uh, same methodology so it is a bit different comparing with the hacking so you should be aware of this methodology so please please go through this only once again and in, if, if you if you go to an interview or if you got any project try to implement this methodology uh, we have some other applications and all so you have to work on that so for lab setup, you have to download uh, one virtual machine, OWASP BWA. So download this virtual machine. Uh, you'll get an installed virtual machine, so you can directly open that PMX file and you can use it. And uh, you should be ready with a Burp suit, a free edition. Download it from the internet. I have shown you portsfigure.net. And uh, these two are important. If we have anything else, I'll let you know by going with the course. So let me show you OWASP PWA, just OWASP PWA. And uh, this is a website, or sourceforce.net. Download from this uh, website download directly. You'll get a rare file once you download it. Just click on that. Once you click on that, you'll get a, a rare file. In, uh, location where you all the VMs and uh, open it with the uh, VM evaluation 
know how to open a virtual machine in the VM workstation. So once you open it, you will get. So this is how you will get it. It's 1.75. So open it. And once you open it, uh, you will get a virtual machine automatically. It will work, and it will give you one IP address. If you type that IP address in your browser, it will open uh, uh, one application or every application. That's it. Very simple. So. So if you run the virtual mesh, you can see this uh, screenshot. So this is the a screenshot you get when you once you run the OSBWA, and you'll get the IP address like this, uh, not like this. I mean, a different IP address you can see. And if you type that IP address in the browser. You can see the application like this. Okay, so this is how you will get the application. Try to install it and uh, uh, run your virtual machine and download the uh, website also. So we will work on uh, OSBWA. It is having uh, so many vulnerable applications. We will use uh, two or three among, among them. So, that is what about the validation security test. So Chaitanya, is there any doubt on this? Uh, no, no, not on my methodology. Okay, so just download this uh, West BWA lab setup and uh, we'll start doing attacks and all from tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Chaitanya, we'll meet tomorrow. Uh, good night. Good night. Bye.